while we're waiting for more people to, I see Jordan's here, but uh, do we have any show and tell for the people here in space? We've already discussed the show and tell. He didn't discuss it with you. No, this is going to be you and me. So, so the last thing we saw, I, I do need to break it myself. I know I'm very bad at that. I just like the photos. That way I can't break the class by accident. Um, You're responsible. That's what some people say. So uh, after I tried the round box, and I went for the straight box. Oh yeah, the straight rectilinear box for the people at home. We have a lovely box with a smile on it. Oh, just wait till you see the sides. <laughs> it says woohoo. And then my company for that. For all your spare stuff, beautiful. Yeah, that's all. That's... And then that's all it says on the sides. Very fun, very fun. Simple laser cut project. Yeah, and last thing is last night. Uh, it's some Bridgeport milling, so that was pretty cool. That's fun. It's hard for them to see. Oh so, yeah, I'll share it with you. So it's great too. So you got a nice block of aluminum there. Yeah, Brandon was awesome. So it's very good uh, learning experience. Adam is here and there. <laughs> Join the meeting. Oh, we got version two. Two sided. Ah, see, much easier to read, much easier to read. I don't know if anybody remembers what uh, Gina had last time. It was like two weeks ago for the barb car. We now have the front and back, and I no longer will accidentally say what it is because it says a classic ride since 2005. There you go. Very good, very good. Um, anything else anyone's working on in here? Any surprises coming down the pipe or what? Um, no, I mean... This is a two part, two part ornament, and this should have a hook, but it was too thin, so it broke off. So there will be a fishing line from this point to this first circle, and then it spins. And then this will have, well, I don't know, so I, yeah. but this will end up being two sided on the other side. It's not two sided right now. But it'll be more like this, where it's got the heart on both sides in a gray piece. Yeah. So, how did you uh, solve the problem of laser cutting on both sides? Uh, just what we discussed um, was to make a duplicate copy and then flip it horizontally and make sure that you reposition flipped over the pieces very yeah. carefully. You essentially created a jig that would allow you to maintain the parts orientation regardless of you know, what orientation it was. And the lovely part is that I ended up getting two sets of products. Yeah. And you could technically even reuse it. Yeah. Which is pretty cool. Javi, anything coming down, or uh, that's all we got for right now? That's all we got for right now. All right, cool. Um, anybody hey, online? I see Jordan's there. Of course, you know, Adam has nothing to share because he's right here. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Adam. It's just can, so easy. You're just right share, there. I can even share my screen to share what I have. But what? Does Jordan have anything? But, Jordan, yes, please. Uh, you have precedent. Hiya, sorry, nothing this week. That's totally okay. Um, you know, sometimes we don't have time to finish up these projects, but we're hopefully we'll be able to share something very soon, even if it's just a few photos. So, Adam, did you have something you want to share? I, I did. I actually, it's a bit of a uh, preview of what's to come. In some ways, I used the, uh, or my partner in the project used the vinyl cutter slash plotter for its plotting capabilities um, and I did some uh, inlaying using the CNC machine this is a let's see if I can share share my screen um, lovely this is the uh, it looks like it's frame. upside down. Can it is rotate? indeed upside down. Yeah, that was the, <laughs> that's the gag photo. I swear I put it the right way after that. Um, but the text in the photo 
or the text in the frame was drawn with a pen on the vinyl plotter that nice. we're going to be talking about tonight. Um, and then the, the uh, text on the frame was inlaid on the CNC machine. If I can what out. is the, um, what, what does the document say? Uh, it is the, it is a one year anniversary present for oh. a couple of friends of my girlfriends. It's yeah. very nice. A framed, uh, the wedding vows. Yes. Yeah. And the page is unresponsive. Yeah, unfortunately. now you get the cute photo. But let's see. Do I have anything fun to share? I'm. There we go. Mm -hmm. um, I am rebuilding. Uh, some dining room chairs. So this one is the proof of concept here. Uh, the final color and everything, they're gonna be painted a lovely sage green. And my partner and I found them at an estate sale for a dollar each. Hey, so I, I've completely disassembled them, taken off the old finish, and I'm currently in the process of making them nice and smooth. So Hello. Hey. welcome. All right, so I think we can go ahead and get started with the bulk of the material today. Danton, not to put you on the spot, but do you have any? Oh, I think you were pointing at me because I was like, oh, oh. like your point. This is very. I'm gonna stop my video now. This is a little bit. Much. Um, we just we're finishing up show and tell. Do you have anything to show and or tell? I don't have anything to show. I'm working on my table. Do another training for the day building and um, forging. So I have an idea of what I need to do. I just need to go by. Yeah. Awesome. I'm Sean, by the way. I'm Denton. Denton. Yeah. Right. So I'm familiar with everybody in the room, which is always great when you're the person talking. In the room. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Again, anybody on chat right now? We've got Jordan. So. If there is any questions you have, please don't be frightened to go ahead and ask a question. And actually, what I'm going to do, I'm going to share my desktop because I have some demos in store for later. So we're going to go ahead and start with the title of today's unit, Vector Design and Vinyl. So no surprises coming to this, so this you don't know what's coming up. up. So, so we're, we're going to review, review a little bit, and I wish this would go away. You gotta like, there we go. Just helping out for everybody here. So um, we're going to obviously address, I'm talking about the vinyl plotter, much to Adam's foreshadowing there. Uh, so we're going to review what we did about vector graphics and also how that becomes vector path for the purpose of using the vinyl plotter. But we talked talk about, about the vinyl plotter designing for a different situation where you're creating the vinyl applications, the software we use, and then of course, sticking a pen in it, which again is foreshadowed by Adam's work earlier. It's almost like you planned it to work this well with this unit. I actually didn't, but it is a beautiful. See, doesn't it make you sound a lot smarter? Just flow with it. So, was fate. <laughs> As fate would have it. So, so again, again we're mostly, mostly going to review. We talked talk a lot about this last time. time. This, this is, is a video, video. Um, just showing um, like vector art. Like, wouldn't be the same without its colorful ghosts and the familiar yellow protagonist. Pixels hadn't always been the only way. In the early days of the arcade, there were two principal paradigms for rendering an image on the screen. Raster and vector. Raster comes from the Latin word rastrum, meaning rake, and today is the more familiar method of drawing on screen. The electron beam rapidly sweeps every line of the display in sequence, forming a grid. And line by line, a picture is assembled. Vector graphics directly manipulate the electron beam to form their images in a similar manner to an oscilloscope. Indeed, very early games like Tennis for Two used an oscilloscope display. 
The most famous spectre arcade title is Asteroids. The more its graphics might be sparse, the perfectly smooth polygons can burnish certain charms. Asteroids is not just a game, it's a game of the world. Compare the appearance of two similar games and you'll see that they're using each of these methods. The smooth vector lines of Space War versus the blockier pixels of Star Cruiser. Vector graphics are cleaner but less versatile. While raster images can't reproduce smooth lines, their ability to render more complex scenes and filled shapes help to secure the pixels' dominance. That's just a little bit about the history of vector and raster. Pretty cool about cathode ray tubes. How many people are aware that it's electron beam in your old CRT TVs? Everybody was aware of that. Oh, so that mm, was a mm. so, so, again, to cover what we're looking at here, um, this is kind of showing uh, the imagery down here at the bottom of the screen is kind of showing how different systems actually interpret raster versus vector files. Um, and again, kind of covering common vector type formats. SVG is the most common one we're using a lot, but of course, DXF, AI, PDF, also very common. Uh, when you have something that's a raster or pixelated image, those are going to be .bmp for bitmap, or what we're very familiar with, JPEG, PNG, and you can see GIF and TIFF there as well. That's how I'll be pronouncing them. Now, there are a lot of different programs that actually manipulate vectors. Um, Adobe Illustrator is you know, the most similar to Inkscape, which is what we use here primarily at Makehaven. Sketch, which is also a type of UI prototyping software. And uh, then you have Coral, have Coral Draw, Draw, which is, is more, more in line with digital, digital recreation of what it's like to actually sketch. sketch. And uh, uh, Grab it. And actually, I forget what the other one's called here. Affinity Designer. Those are two I have less familiarity with myself. I don't know if anybody else has played with them at all. But Sketch, Illustrator, Coral, and Inkscape are all things that uh, I've used before. They each have their own strengths and weaknesses. And we'll kind of go over a little bit of that later. Um, so when we're talking about vectors, you have to realize that they're not photographs. You can see in this GIF over here how the vector image can be manipulated quite easily after it's been established. And if we recall, that's because the vectors that make up the image are mathematical interpolations between points, whereas a pixel artwork is just a mosaic of tiles, if you will. So when it's describing this geometry, um, it's using all mathematics to basically understand where everything's supposed to be in space. So this is why it's very ideal for things like CNC's, vinyl cover, uh, cutters, and uh, laser cutters as well, um, because it essentially is the geometric data of where to go to cut out this particular shape. So you can see here with how a, a, a simple browser actually interprets the uh, SVG file within it. And you can see here that it's describing the box, what its coordinates are, and then it's also establishing by a code the actual fill and the stroke color and the stroke width. Those are typically things that are going to define vector artwork, their fill, their stroke, and the actual thickness of that, that stroke. That's also we get into um, Inkscape, um, the idea that an object has to be turned into a path. And that's kind of the workflow of Inkscape, where there's going to be artwork you're going to create, then you're going to do object to path to actually turn it into individual paths describing a shape for a laser cutter or a vinyl cutter or a CNC machine to actually follow. You can see within this animated GIF how it goes from being a text object into something that actually has described coordinates for a machine to follow. I know that I banned both of you on the laser. Did you get the laser badge a couple of weeks ago? Have you used Inkscape? OK. So you can see these are all examples of different pieces of vector artwork, all generated in different ways. 
Um, what's, what's really nice, nice about that character, character art is, well, uh, I said it two weeks, weeks ago, ago. Does anybody remember what the super cool thing about that character artwork is? Very scalable, and I imagine you might have read that um, on the slide, but you didn't. I did not. Yeah, I am very impressed. I am absolutely impressed. I just didn't spend a lot of time. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what's the Inkscape for me. <laughs> but, but you remember that they're almost infinitely scalable, which is always really cool. And what that means is, unlike doing like, you know, grab a JPEG off of the internet, that's usually very low quality, they try to blow it up, and it's like just a completely pixelated where it's unrecognizable. But what's great about vector artwork is that this Bart Simpson to the Obama mobile poster can all be scaled up in that definitely vector environment and not lose any quality. That makes them incredibly powerful. Um, there are, of course, um, some ways to make them more successful. You can see in that bolded list there, um, they typically will have a reduced, reduced palette. You can make them more sophisticated, sophisticated however. You can kind of see this swirling logo here, which almost looks like, like a prototype, prototype logo to the Google suite, but I'm pretty sure it's a logo of something I'm not quite sure. Almost, I think it's the, is that the Pixma or the, um, what's one of those file sharing? websites, I forget. But anyway, you can see that there's a bit of a gradient in there. Um, and vectors can perform gradients as fills. They can do patterns as fills. There's actually quite a few things they can do that would be more challenging to a certain extent in a pixel environment. Um, but for making them most successful, they're great for nice, broad, flat colors and nice, thick outlines, or as in the case of the Obama poster, big, splashy areas of color. In vector designing, especially if you're trying to make something um, look very realistic, it's actually better off, especially if you're going to be doing something later on with that vector file, excuse me, to minimize its photorealistic complexity. And by, by that, you, you can, can actually import photographs, look at your program, and you can perform a lot of trace of that image to actually create a drawing in vector line work of that image. And we'll simply make something incredibly complex with like hundreds of nodes. And it's not the best when you're trying to manipulate it quickly and change colors to do stuff, but it is something you can do, um, especially if you plan to be cutting something out. It's always best to kind of stay simpler because you're able to more easily keep track of your artwork and actually control what you want the machine to do without having multiple, multiple layers and different things to keep in mind as you put something together. But like with the Hope poster, that is a great example of something where you would still have actually a great deal of complexity to the image, but since it's for print, you don't necessarily have to worry about like cutting it out or using it on a laser engraver. You're just printing it. So it's very close, but not quite the ShareX logo. What is it? It's so close to that. It's, 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 it's some, some, I'm sure it's sure. Some. Some. Um, well, well, like we were just saying, saying vectors are scalable. So this is an example for an improv comedy festival where they were able to make a gigantic sign using the same source vector. And that's what's great about this. And that's why a lot of companies, when they design logos or different types of specific artwork pieces, they're made in vector format so that if you've got to slap it on the side of the building or you have to put it at the top of your letterhead, you have an infinitely scalable uh, piece of artwork that can be used anywhere. Uh, I guess a fun fact when it comes to printing, uh, because a lot of times, um, if you're not going to be cutting it out, the vector will then have to be put into a raster environment to then be printed in some way. Um, vectors are fully compatible with programs like Photoshop, um, even uh, PowerPoint can also accept vector artwork and it turns it into a rasterized image. Um, what's great about that is that you can always enlarge the size you need, drop it into the pixel it's environment, environment and have a nice crisp, crisp image. image. It comes out of that. There, there can be, in some instances, um, interesting conversations between programs, especially when you're transferring vector data between different programs and even from vector, vector pixel. pixel. Sometimes, Sometimes things, things get interpreted in different ways. ways. And I'll, I'll talk, talk about, about that one just to show some examples um, on my machine of stuff that you do. Um, vector vector objects uh, are also great for font. Fonts are usually rendered as um, vector objects. Um, on any web browser, but that's why we're saying control plus. If you go in a web browser, open up a new tab, and you do control plus, or if you're on a Mac, Apple plus, or, oh, sorry, command plus, Apple's the old way. You can actually 
uh, enlarge and shrink your web page, and the text actually doesn't lose its resolution. They are SVG objects that are being scaled larger and bigger based on your new preferences. This also means that font, as it is in certain word processing systems, are always represented as a vector object, but obviously to manipulate them and use them in different ways, you still have to convert them into different types of objects for the purposes of cutting things out. Anybody who's used a laser cutter already knows if it stays as a text object, the laser cutter does not like that. It actually has to see it as individual paths. That's weird. Oh, there we go. It's good. No, that was very strange. That's still not sharing. Uh, it fell off for me, actually. Okay. Oh, are you still on Zoom? I'm not seeing you no. in the meeting. Something happens to the meeting. Oh. Let's try that again. You want to just message the uh, foundations group to say that they want to Yeah. Well, I'm actually still seeing the meeting. Did you? I'm connecting. Okay. I have. You're on Wi Fi. Yeah. Hmm. And you do you want to quit and restart Zoom and see if yeah, that will do that? Sorry. As, as with most technology, turning it off and turning it back on Save. always the first thing that you try. For your eyes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you can remember this, this is, string of characters. This is confidential. So, so we can uh, go zoom. To illicitly <laughs> start the foundation zoom. I don't know. My machine, I have it pulled up. Yeah, why don't we go ahead and continue with the demo? Uh, uh, let's just try this. All mouse downs, close all tabs, and restart. I uh, don't know. Yeah, I can't even connect. Yeah, that's something going on with that. So, unfortunately, people in here will have the advantage of my demos, but not necessarily everybody else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just unplug it. Good. up. Okay. So, uh, yep. Yeah. All right. So we're back, everybody. Sorry about that. We had a weird thing all of a sudden. But uh, and if we remember, when we're building shapes, there are things that are uh, Boolean operators. So that's kind of the big thing with vector art, especially when you're trying to create really dynamic shapes. 
actually being able to uh, select different types of orientations to, or different types of combinations in order to create more dynamic shapes. You're actually able to slice and combine shapes using different Boolean operators, which Boolean is just a fancy word of like yes and no. Anybody who's worked in the coding world is familiar with that. Actually, I don't have a good fact. <laughs> oh, um, just you have to get, yeah. Um, okay. You click on that, or yeah, there you click on that. Uh, or right click on um, the icon for um, Chrome. Uh, I might just stop share and then start share again. I don't. Yeah, you have to right click on the icon for Chrome. There you go. Uh -huh. it's, it's a weird thing. It's oh, because it was full screen. Okay. Yeah, because it's full screen. It won't We're good. I think we are yeah. all set. We're back. Several technical issues. So um, these are some things, and we'll take a look at this um, later. But uh, basically, any kind of geometry, you can combine it in different ways to create more dynamic shapes. So. Vectors as tool paths. So um, in vector designs, as this slide implies, what you see is not always what you get. Because um, what can be challenging is that sometimes with vector elements, they can be set to zero thickness, or they can be set to a color that's hard to see, or to a treatment that's hard to see, or may even have a color applied to them that is not rendering properly, so it makes it appear like the line is not there. Or sometimes control nodes can be orphaned and just kind of sitting somewhere in your file and you don't realize it. So um, the other challenging thing is also that most vector programs can have multiple layers. And those multiple layers can have different pieces of artwork on them. And sometimes if you're just randomly selecting, copying, and pasting, you may end up copying and pasting something that you did not intend. Um, that's where just experience and learning how to stay organized in your vector files are a great way as you move forward exploring and learning what these programs to do. So um, you can see here, um, <laughs> More things go away. <laughs> so you can see how in certain instances um, with these ellipses, um, the ellipses can be defined, but in certain instances, if you extend the ellipse, you ruin the illusion of, of depth that the original uh, logo has. So if you look closely, and I'll gesture with the mouse so people at home can see, or no, I can't use my mouse, but it's this one. You can see here how on the original, we have a actual ellipse going behind the bear over here, and there are areas where the bear's foot is standing over it. Whereas if you extended it, you kind of lose that illusion. And that, in some instances, can also cause issues when, for instance, a laser cutter or other type of device is trying to interpret what's happening. Because if you were a laser cutter or a vinyl cutter that is seeing the ellipses and the artwork of the bear, and you try to cut everything, you're going to end up cutting through the bear image and not actually creating the layered image that is represented here. And this is where you have to think about how things actually cut out. So the vector graphics are always based on lines that usually have little control nodes coming off of them, that each node having two little control handles that are essentially the vector that is veering off of that node and blending into an adjoining one. When you're working with any tools, you're changing the locations of those nodes, changing the angle of attack of the vector, the magnitude of that vector, and you're also adding and subtracting material as you work through it. This is like the Animorphs logo to me of us. I don't know if I'm like really getting a deep cut for anybody in here, but that's what I, the first thing I thought of when I saw this. Um, but something to realize, and what that bottom paragraph is talking about, is if we look at one half being the green and black side and the other half, uh, just the red side, sort of representing how this might be cut, we have to understand how um, our laser cutter or our vinyl cutter might actually start interpreting what all this is going to look like. And it sees the paths, not necessarily the fill, but it sees the lines that make up the artwork. 
And if that were, for instance, to pass under something, the artwork needs to express that. So for instance, if right here on the A, as I motion over with the mouse, you can see this line between the white and black hats. If I wanted that to actually be cut out by a final cutter, I would have to make sure a small vertical line is there to describe that as a fully complete piece. And then, for instance, I could have additional artwork showing that it's being covered up or going behind something. But you have to realize to just have the artwork sometimes is half the battle. You actually need to consider how the machine is going to interpret it. So again, like I mentioned before, SPGs have two major components, fills and strokes. So um, you can see here as it's represented uh, via a um, actual uh, web browser, uh, there are always those two components of fill and stroke. And also fills and strokes can have their own interesting artifacts about them. So you can see that in this ABC, um, we've got a red infill and a blue line outfill. You'll notice on the lower corner of the C, however, a tiny errant artifact. That could be something left over from how the C was originally drawn. It can even be just artifact of the settings of the line. But that is something where I could think, might that be cut? Is that represented in artwork? Or is it an artifact of how the artwork is being treated? So the other thing to consider is how things like stroke width are actually going to affect the machines we use. So for Gina and Javi, what's something we know about strokes from using a laser cutter? That means then you gotta specify within the pixels that it, It'll be interpreted after, but yeah, it always has to be set to very, very thin. Our laser cutters, and there are like different laser cutters out there that interpret data a little bit differently, but for laser cutters downstairs especially, they can't really discern between inside and outside of a stroke. They just see line. And if there's a stroke attached to it, the laser cutter, even the vinyl cutter too, doesn't realize that that's like part of the shape. For it, that is an artifact of the visual style applied to the line that it doesn't see. So for instance, if this ABC was in fact an interesting final decal we had created that was in two layers, a red layer and a blue layer. If we wanted that ring shape of blue around all the letters, that would have to be its own shape cut out and then we would align and apply it together to create this effect. Does that make sense? Cool. Um, also another on that third bullet there, we also wanna pay attention to RGB values and how they affect how machines interpret information. Some machines don't like fills. Some machines can't see certain colors. A lot of them are really finicky with how, with how those colors are defined. As we know from laser cutting, what environment should we be in? What color environment should we be in? RGB. RGB. Uh, you have to be careful because sometimes a lot of programs default to CMYK, which is typical for printing. It stands for cyan, yellow, magenta, black. I saw your face, Holly. Yeah, I got you. I got you. Oh, oh I just got somebody. Oh. Here. See, I keep wanting to use my mouse. I should get rid of it. I've admitted somebody to the space. All right. So, best practice for vector tool paths um, point one keeping everything on a single layer. That's just to make sure you don't have absolute headaches with it. Uh, when you're working with vectors, um, I find a very helpful thing is if I've gotten my vectors like 90% there and I really like what I'm doing, copy, paste it onto a new layer. Layers in graphic programs are essentially like, if you can visualize it, it's just taking another sheet of paper and laying it on top and doing more artwork on that piece of paper. Each layer being a new piece of paper that's completely separate from the layers below it. However, vector programs like to be really screwy and allow you to select objects across multiple layers. And then when you copy, it'll flatten them all into one image. Just something to keep track of and realize that's what those programs do. You can avoid this by actually, there's usually a little icon on the layer that will let you lock it, meaning it stops any form of editing to it, and you can also hide it so you're not looking at it anymore to be distracted. In terms of making sure it's going to be a toolpath 
Single layers are also very important because it's that layer that's going to be seen. And if you have other ghosted layers that are also in there, it could lead to aberrant behavior of the machine going forward. So always make sure um, a good practice there is to actually make sure you have a working file and then like your final export version. So a lot of times when I'm working with vector artwork, I'll have like just this file that's a complete mess, all kinds of different shapes, stuff going on. And then when I've got the artwork I like, I'll open up a new file that's set up to all the parameters that I need, fit my artwork on there, and export that just to make sure I have a clean file. Um, there are, of course, other ways to keep that cleanliness. That's just one that's worked for me for many years. Um, in terms of overlapping shapes, um, you always want to make sure you're like clipping things out, meaning that if you have overlapping shapes, if I want an oval to appear on top of a circle, I have to realize that A, they have to be two separate shapes in order for something to cut them as two separate objects. But I also have to make sure that there's space between them, especially with the vinyl cutter because it's going to create a sticker out of one material. We've covered the RGB color space. And we also want to think ahead about different settings the machine is going to have, how the machine is going to behave, and the colors that machine can interpret. Like I mentioned, some colors just don't work with certain machines. As we know from laser cutting, if you don't have red on the RGB scale all the way up to 255, again, that great arbitrary 100% number of 255, um, the laser cutter just doesn't know what to do with that color. It's like, that's not red, it's pinkish. It's very red pink though. Um, also, when it comes to working in certain vector art, um, again, depending on what the final result is, it's going to be a tool path Things like gradients or other very complex visual fills are not going to translate. The laser cutter doesn't know what to do when you give it a fill that's a gradient. It's just going to say, like, well, I guess this is a color, and it'll just kind of do its best. And when we let the machine just kind of do its best, it's like with AI nowadays that they get, like, 10 fingers on one hand and, like, a weird eyeball in their armpit or something. But it's trying, okay? Let's give it a break. Um, Making sure that when we have text that needs to appear on our artwork, that it's converted to curves. Actually, last night I was imagining somebody on a laser cutter and I had a really interesting error with uh, text interpretation I've never seen before. Is that um, it was an etch pass, but because we had neglected to uh, double check that the line weight was down to the right size, it actually etched the entire uh, area of that fill as one object, even though all we could see on the screen was the correct image we wanted to create. So the thick line that was around the text remained even though we had turned off the fill to make it a shape. So even when you think you've got it nailed, sometimes they find a way to really throw a loop for you. So what do you mean convert text? That's exactly uh, like when you use the laser cutter, setting the object to a path and turning it from uh, actual text objects into geometric objects that can be interpreted as paths. Does that make sense? Curves are a lot of times, uh, it does refer to something that's, you know, curvilinear, that's the word, but at the same time, like curves and lines, relatively interchangeable in this space. Um, some, some export systems even refer to them as curves or lines and arcs or certain spaces. Um, objects also need to be vector paths. Another thing to remember, whenever you create something specifically for uh, any of the tools that we use through Inkscape, when you have your artwork, the text, artwork, and shapes have to be converted into paths. That is essentially the way it starts to convert just something that's artistic to an actual path of geometric data the machine can interpret. Minimizing the number of nodes. Now, this can kind of go depending on what you're trying to do. You've seen some of the samples downstairs. Some stuff can get incredibly complex, and there's probably hundreds of thousands of nodes in some of the examples downstairs. So as a general practice, minimizing the number of nodes, that is the number of control points on an object, is a good way to keep the file size low and to also make the machine work a little less hard. Um, but obviously, sometimes you may want to do something that's going to have a bit of a complex shape, and you're going to kind of be caught between a rock and a hard place. But just realize the disadvantage that can come with having all that data that needs to be interpreted. And then also double cuts. This is something that can happen where you accidentally have two shapes layered on top of each other, or you've applied a weird uh, 
stroke uh, attribute to something where it's going to have a double line around something. And that means the laser cutter or vinyl cutter, cutter will pass over something that's already cut. With the laser cutter, not a terrible thing to happen every so often. I've had it happen and I cannot go let it explain why. It's like you delete every single line, just paste the artwork by itself, and somehow it still cuts double. You don't know why. It's more critical with the vinyl cutter because, as you can imagine, as we'll get into in a few minutes, the vinyl cutter is a knife passing over plastic. So if something is already cut and it tries to cut it again, it might cut through the backing, which is a bad thing, or get caught on the already cut vinyl and just drag it around all through the machine and completely ruin your cuts. So things to keep in mind. Any questions about some of these critical ideas to consider before moving forward? I see no messages online. Anybody online, if you have questions, feel free to just drop them into the chat. Just to be extra safe. Yep, don't see anything in the chat. It's possible to turn on. I would love that. You got it. It was a little, little stuffy in here when I first got it. So, vinyl cutters are just 2G plotters. Plotters being essentially, as you can see in that lovingly archaic example, of essentially a big one by one sheet of paper that a machine through CNC control can actually draw an image on. If you've ever used, I don't know if anybody here has ever worked with uh, really high quality printers, but very high quality printers still use this exact same CNC system. Uh, I had the fortunate opportunity to see a Mamaki printer, which is like some of the most sophisticated, like advanced printers that they have. It's like a huge eight by 10 bin, looks exactly like a CNC machine, but instead of a cutter head, it's got a special inkjet system that just shoots ink at a very specific pixel point and just goes around adding color. It's pretty cool. And it can also print on like undulating surfaces. So it can actually detect how high something is and like print on an uneven surface and then like actively distort it and stuff. It's pretty cool. But what you can see here on this page are uh, the uh, examples there. You can see different types of cutter heads for different types of jobs, all having different blade angles, different leaf angles, and different tasks. Uh, you can see with the different colored nubs on them, they could be identified by color based on the manufacturer. Um, different manufacturers, like if you use a Cricut machine, it's going to be different from what we have downstairs. I believe it is Epson. Roland, that's it. That's it. But yeah, Epson, Roland, Cricut, they're kind of the main vinyl cutters you'll see hanging around the place. They all have different standards on how they refer to their tools and maybe slightly different ways they engage with tools. But they're usually exactly what you see there, a simple plunger mechanism with some kind of dangerously sharp blade on the bottom made of a very hard material. Um, it's basically a drag knife system. And you can see from this great uh, side view right here that we have a blade that slices through vinyl, but not through a back. And that's so when it's done, we can remove it. And now we have our vinyl shapes that can then be applied to something else. So this is, uh, I think this actually is the vinyl cutter downstairs. And you can see that it has a pretty simple system on how it's actually able to meet the X, Y coordinates of whatever you send to it. We have the X axis motion of the carriage. It can move all the way across the machine. And the rollers on the machine actually advance, but also move the vinyl in the Y direction in order to meet the different coordinates. The only Z axis control in a vinyl cutter is the up and down motion of engaging or disengaging the knife or pen that is currently loaded into the cartridge. There are costs to making the stickers. Um, just like the laser cutter, there is like a scrap area of like just discarded vinyl that's too small to keep around. It's great for doing tests. But there are, of course, rolls of vinyl that are going to cost some material, some cost for you to actually use. Just like before, it's like everything else at Nick Haven, record what you use and then pay for it. There is a cash box by the vinyl rollers or just like everything else, pay for it online. One thing that's pretty cool, and I like that they mentioned it here, is that the third paragraph, uh, like Adam did with his project, you can put a pen into the plotter and you can actually just take a simple, good old fashioned piece of paper from home, load that to the vinyl cutter and see how the pen will draw out your cut pattern, allowing you to troubleshoot to see if you've actually thought about how your sticker will cut out properly. So 
Any questions before we get into specifically the designing for vinyl cutouts? Yes. So does vinyl look at the sticker material? Yeah, exactly the sticker. Basically, you're making really fancy stickers. Oh, okay. So instead of being a paper sticker, it's vinyl, so it's PVC plastic. It's very flexible, very malleable. It's great for applying things to rounded surfaces. You've probably seen basically all the making signage is made using vinyl applications on rounded surfaces. Yes. Make it look the doors, those are all cut vinyl pieces. Uh, and we'll kind of get into how we have cool floating objects like that in a shape like this, because as you can imagine, if I peel this out of the vinyl sheet, well, how does that stuff come along with us? I guess I'm going to break that mystery in a moment. So basically, let's get back to fill and stroke, right? Fill is the area inside, the stroke are the lines on the outside. The fill has a defined color, the stroke is a line with a defined width and color. So for plotters, they only need a fill. The shape should only be filled. So that the vinyl cutter is interpreting the shape that will be cut. Okay? It doesn't interpret a stroke, and if you do add a stroke, it will do that instance of double cutting. So even if it's a very, very thin stroke, it's going to want to pass over that area again, like I said before, potentially catch on already cut vinyl and ruin your cut, and that means you've got to buy more material to cut it again. Um, now, stickers, of course, have different degrees of complexity. What's interesting about all these examples, can anybody uh, have a guess on uh, which ones are less complex and which ones are more complex? You're going to cut them out yourself. Assuming the boat is one of the more complex ones. More complex. What's cool about the boat, though, is that it's having a lot of dynamic graphical elements, but it's still one contiguous shape. Nothing's broken. If I were to be laying that onto a water bottle, for instance, it would be challenging to get it off the vinyl and place it on, but you'd actually be able to do it all in one pass. Something like this smiley face, the paw print, the rocket ship, even the stolen bones, um, those have floating objects around them. So in order to make sure we could actually put that on something, we're going to have to think a little bit more. Even deeper still, like the Marge Simpson head, we can have different levels of color, different layers of color, where we can combine vinyl stickers together to create something that looks like a separate piece of artwork. Now, this is where we have to think about how things are placed on an object in relation to each other. So here are the three things we have to remember. Backing, vinyl, and masking. So backing, like I said, it's what the original vinyl was on. It's usually paper. Uh, very rarely will you find another plastic as the backer. I've never come across it, but I have come across like certain backers that are like a little bit different, maybe have been treated differently, so it's not 100% paper. Vinyl is the actual sticker you want, the actual material that we'll be placing on an object. It is usually colored in some way, and like I said, it's flexible and somewhat elastic. So keep that in mind. A lot of times if you pulled off your vinyl, let's say I placed it on here and didn't do it just right and try to pull it off, I'm going to end up distorting it because the vinyl likes to a lot. So how do we avoid having a lot of those issues while also maintaining positional accuracy of floating components? We use masking. And it's just something that I didn't think was real, but it's just a, imagine a roll of masking tape that's 48 inches wide. That's what masking is. It's basically a big old roll of masking tape. And what you do is you can pull out a big piece, layer it on top of your vinyl. It is more adhesive than the backer is to the vinyl. So you can peel it off peel off everything together from the vinyl, then apply your masking to the surface you wish to have the audio put onto, and the vinyl is stickier to the surface than the masking is to it. It's just differing levels of adhesive strength. <laughs> it's, it's kind of weird, but it's also kind of magical to do it. I've, I've done some sign building in my past, and like it's really cool when you can transfer that stuff, and you pull off the mask, and you're like, holy crap. It's like I actually did it somehow. 
but it does work. It just means you need to have a lot of care in applying things. Definitely when you're, um, when you're uh, cutting the vinyl, it's going to have a lot of area in it that we have to remove. So if we look over at the making an example here on this door, when it was originally cut out, this entire thing would have been just one big red circle with different cut lines. In order to create this logo, we had to remove this uh, vinyl shape of the robot in a process called weeding, where we remove vinyl we don't need for the purpose of what we're trying to create. So we peeled out the robot shape in order to leave the H, M, and the two I's in place in the red medallion the robot appears in. And I'm sorry for people at home, it's the main Make Haven logo with the robot, just so you know what I'm talking about. It's on the door of the room here. Um, when you have properly weeded your artwork, uh, you also probably, because imagine this is going to be on a big sheet of vinyl, so it's also going to be a big red area that this is on, I would have removed that big red area too. Meaning that the only thing I will see on my backing before applying the mask is everything I want to put onto the wall, onto the glass, onto the object. I then take a nice big piece of that crazily large masking tape, and I very diligently press it, making sure there are no bubbles. I might use a plastic squeegee to make sure all the air is removed and that there is proper adhesion to the vinyl. And then I hold the backing paper, peel off the mask, and I have my vinyl sticker ready to apply to a different surface. That's just kind of a little overview of the process. Is somebody trying to enter, or is there a question? No. Oop, oop. All right. So that's where you can see, as I mentioned, with uh, different ways to apply vinyl, the Homer Simpson, for instance, was applied in a similar technique However, there are multiple colors. So the Make Haven logo is great because it's just one color with multiple objects. But let's say I have multiple shapes that require positional accuracy, excuse me, positional accuracy on their placement. So that's where we're going to use a thing called registration marks. They're gonna help us make sure that these separate elements all align together. And so you can see here with uh, Buttercup for Powerpuff Girls, um, we have the different color layers. So for instance, in order to achieve the illusion that they're colored in, we have a full black backer. We have a layer for green, a layer for the flesh color, and a layer for white. This is what's cool about vinyls, that we can actually use white as an applied color. And you can see those little rectangles above. Those rectangles are the registration marks. As we progressively have mask layers, so we have the different pieces of vinyl on masking tape, we layer them on in a particular order in order to create the illusion of the fully illustrated image. So for instance, we would start with the black, then probably do the green or flesh, and then finish off with the white. Um, and that's something we would know depending on how we had set up the file. Luckily, a lot of the colored layers don't seem to intersect with each other. You can see how they're utilizing black to do a lot of work with the final decal at the very end. There are some challenges with this, however. Um, the black being used for the base of this image is a very strong color. Some vinyls are mildly translucent when you get to different colors. So there is a possibility that if we were to make this, the black might bleed through a little bit and make the overall color a little dull. Uh, it sometimes is just an issue of the vinyl quality. Some cheaper vinyls obviously are a little thinner, and they're going to allow more light to bleed through, but more expensive, thicker vinyls will be more likely to maintain their color. Something to keep in mind, and also why it's a good idea to sometimes test your vinyl applications on dark materials to see if that will alter their color. So we're back to this slide of stickers of increasing complexity, I guess, because we're going to do even more. So again, we can have adhesive vinyl lettering. Now, this is where we have to think about how something is going to be legible after it's stuck on. So if we go over to this vacating example, the sticker isn't on this side of the door. It's actually on the other side, feel the lip of the vinyl. So that means the adhesive side was over here 
So when we were cutting it, it looked from this direction. All right, and we were lucky because maybe on a clear object, we want to see it from this direction. So, but if we wanted to flip it and instead adhere it to this side, we would have had to flip the artwork so it would appear straight when you're on the inside of the room. But they don't care about us here on the inside of the room, only people on the outside. But that's why also if you're doing the adhesive vinyl lettering specifically on something that will appear on a, um, on a uh, uniform, I don't know why I could think of that word, you have to realize that in certain instances, because of where the actual sticky side is going to be, you've got to make sure that when it's placed with the sticky side down, it's going to be in the correct orientation. That's where, for instance, prototyping, like was suggested earlier, by putting a pen in the cutter, to, uh, and you just kind of flip it over, you can see like, okay, if I took this off, put it on something, will it be in the correct direction that I want? Um, and it's also good to always do test cuts as well. So if I was doing something this complex, I would probably just take two letters, set up the file, cut it out, mask it, put it on something. Okay, is this coming out the way I want? And then I realize, oh, I got to flip it horizontally or vertically to get the effect I'm going for. So software for cutting vinyl on the plotter. So we're going to look at a very particular example. Um, with any design, um, you're going to I think this is for a thing we're going to do a little later, but you're going to use Inkscape to create a design and then you're going to actually cut it out. So in this case, we're going to look at Bulbasaur. Great uh, representational character for everybody here. So you can see much like before, there's going to be a large black layer, five layers of color, and then uh, letters and all colors that are used for registration marks. So you can see here, just like with uh, Buttercup from before, we have our black layer and all the different color layers that make everything up. And you see the logic behind how they're breaking up these colors. Because black can easily be seen as a contiguous shape throughout the artwork, we know that's got to be our base layer. And then any other shape that's going to have a lot of additional color we can use. Technically, we could have cut out the blue body of Bulbasaur as one solid piece and then laid on the other elements on top if we wanted to. It uses a bit more material and will mean that the sticker will be kind of that many more layers thick, but it also comes down to what you're going to be doing and how efficient you want to be with the material being used. Just there are, there's more than one way to skin a cat, however what that saying is. So the vinyl can be cut directly from Inkscape on our vinyl cutter downstairs. Um, I think this is just a short video demonstrating how this actually works. And then this moves back and forth. I have a piece of vinyl here that I'm gonna load into the machine. And I need to be conscious of this electronic eye that's right here. And then these placements along the top. So I want to set this here. I'll put the roller feet above it right there and right there. And there's going to be some extra. You can't, you can't cut here or here, but we'll load this down. And it's now mounted, so it doesn't it doesn't move. Now over here, we want to say that we have a piece in and hit enter. And now this is going to measure how wide it is and how long the piece is. Now it knows that it's 5.9 inches by 4 inches. And that's it for the setup. All right, so we have Inkscape here, a simple sticker. If we go view it in outline mode, it's just this. There's no tricky business. Back to that. And it's as easy as going to File, Print. Then we go search through until we find the Roland GS24. We click on preferences and here we do 
get from machine. We want to see it in inches. That matches what was on screen. And then we say, OK, and apply, and then print. Pause everybody. Yep. That's it. Then take this, pull right out. It's a little hard to see. You can peel these off of here. Yeah. So pretty easy, uh, especially if you've seen the badging video for the Roland um, Final Cutter. Those little white tabs are where a roller has to be. Those are like landing zones for the rollers. So when you're putting in a piece, you have to make sure a roller is at least at one of those landing zones. A little eye helps it measure the actual length when it's going through the cut. So you can probably see when it's pulled off the eye, if you look, that's the full length. Um, so, any questions about that? Feeling relatively confident, feeling that it's something doable? Awesome. So, um, for more sophisticated control, there is the Roll and Cut Studio, but like was shown in the example, you can go right out of Inkscape and it's not a big deal. Um, you can do much more advanced techniques um, if you really want to get into using a laser cutter, become very familiar with this particular software. Since it is a company specific software, it tends to have more control over the actual machine, but there's a big but there. Um, a lot of times these programs can be a little clunky to get used to. I'm sure any of us who bought a printer and there's the proprietary printer software it comes with, it's kind of clunky and weird. And like, it also tends to like kind of butt its way into other stuff and can be awkward. But as you saw, Inkscape is more than capable of printing straight to the vinyl cutter. Um, now, this will show a full uh, example of the Bulbasaur being done. And you'll get to see kind of how the registration marks come into play when putting it together. So you'll notice it still it has the masking. And you see how you kind of have to make sure it's pressed real down so the masking will pull it away. And you'll also note how it's already been weeded. Because remember, as we saw with the make cake example, there's a lot of extra material there that's been removed. So they're slowly pulling away the mask. Notice how it's inverted on the mask. And they're going to use the letters as registration. But see how they're using some additional backing to make sure the rest of it doesn't stick? Now they'll remove the backing and allow the rest of the vinyl sticker to be laid down, making sure that the registration and the masking so we can keep everything aligned. A little bit of a mistake there, but not a big deal because it didn't appear from me. But you see how well the vinyl is starting to stick to itself. So that becomes a little challenging. So the letters can be used as registration. Anything can be used as registration. You can even have, as in one of the earlier examples, you just have objects that serve as a registration point for your designs. Um, it doesn't have to be text like in this example, but this is an efficient way to kind of tie in your registration to the file stick. So going into the pen plotter. Again, this is when you just take the blade out and you put pen in place. Um, it can take even just a standard old pen. Granted, you put a little tape around it to make sure it can fit within the actual blade holder, like down there. Um, and it will work on any kind of paper. 
There's also um, some advice here. Tape it to something a bit more rigid, like chipboard. You can have like, some illustration board lying around that might be a, a good idea as well. That way, the thin paper can't shift. Because as you can imagine, paper is a lot thicker than paperback and vinyl. So the clamp might not have enough force, and the paper might want to have a tendency to kind of move a little bit, and you can get caught up by the pen in the process of being drawn on. So having a good, strong backer is a good idea. And um, you'll also see how the pen will actually draw something. Notice how it's just drawing an outline. It's not going to actually draw like thickness of a marker. It's going to do exactly what the blade does and cut, that is, draw right where the knife would be placed. You can kind of see an example image of how it came out versus what the source example would have been. Notice how all the fill is removed and just the outlines remain. But you can do things like uh, this great example of the state of Connecticut here with raster, I'm um, sorry, patterned infills. That is a bunch of lines turning at very strategic points to create the illusion of a shape. You can have it do a raster infill, and just like the laser cutter, it just means it has to pass over little by little by little. And if that's the look you're going for, sure, you can take the time to do it. It's not necessary, though. There are other ways you can give it a shot. The water jet also has some of these similar things and works in a similar fashion. You can see a water jet here cutting through a piece of stone. This is the big advantage of water jets is that they can cut through incredibly thick material and also relatively uneven materials with reasonable accuracy. They just tend to be a little messy and a little slow, but uh, sometimes they can also be a little temperamental depending on uh, which brand they are. But you can see here, you can very successfully cut pretty intricate shapes out of just this random paving rock. Yeah. Um, so water jets are pretty interesting. Basically, same idea as laser cutter or the vinyl cutter. It's just there are some things you have to pay attention to as it works. So with the laser cutter, it's a virtual cutting tool. That is, the laser is intangible for all intents and purposes and can just be shut off. The vinyl cutter has a knife that physically contacts the material and is dragged around and then retracted. The water jet, however, is basically high pressure water. We have a diagram talking about it in a little bit, but it has a uh, high pressure water mixed with sand to erode the material, meaning that it can't just boom, hit cutting speed and cutting concentration right away. It needs to ramp up to full cutting strength. That's why you'll notice on these shapes, see how they kind of continue past certain areas? That's called a lead-in. And that gives the water jet something to start, get to full cutting strength, then cut the shape, then also have a place to exit and wind down. For certain instances where it's stopping a cut, it won't necessarily have to go to an offset cut like that or an out cut like that. Um, but it is good practice just to make sure it will completely cut through the material you're trying to cut. Um, they all, you also need to pay attention to, unlike the laser cutter and the vinyl cutter, things like kerf is more important to pay attention to. Again, the vinyl cutter, we could barely see the cut lines on that example. And for those of us that have laser cutter, it's a very thin kerf, you know, almost, almost imperceptible in some cases. But on the water jet, as you saw in that example, it's like shooting a big, like, eighth-inch jet of water filled with sediment through that object. So that means whatever your object is, you have to make sure you're leaving enough room for it to be cut on the outside so that you can end up with the shape you want. Also important to realize is that the water jet can stay in one place for a moment and potentially erode more material as it's standing there. That's what I talk about relative accuracy with the water jet because it's just shooting water at something. It has a tendency to cut a slight taper to certain objects, and if it dwells in one spot for too long, that erosion will be, that will be greater and greater and actually lead to some inaccurate areas of your part, unless you plan it appropriately and you make sure it's doing that where it doesn't matter. 
Um, there are costs to using it because it is a machine that requires a lot of power and materials to run. So just keep that in mind. As you can see in this diagram, very high pressure water and garnet, which is just very, very hard sand that's also incredibly sharp. It's the actually the same sand used at the sandblaster. So if you ever had a chance to play around with that, same type of sand. They will also scratch up your cell phone screen very badly, as I found one time. Uh, I bought a freestanding sandblaster and got my phone messed, scratched up with some garnet and fell in my pocket. Really fun to discover that. But uh, the sand does most of the work. However, what's really cool, uh, the person who discovered the water jet is actually a logger. And a log was pushed into um, a water cavity that then displaced a bunch of water and shot out of a hose and actually sliced through a little bit of wood. The guy who saw that was like, huh, like I wonder if we could do that better and longer. And so that's how uh, the water jet was invented. And so essentially it's high pressure water, again, mixed with garnet, eroding the material that it passes through. Um, that means the tip has to withstand an immense amount of pressure and has to be incredibly hard as to not be eroded very quickly by the garnet. So that means the tip is brittle and expensive. Isn't that great? <laughs> All those properties are very brittle, expensive materials. But um, it will cut through just about anything. Um, obviously not uh, materials that are much harder than the garnet. Um, in fact, what's cool is in uh, the food industry, they use water jet cutters to slice up meats and other things. Because think about it, it's a blade that doesn't get dirty because as soon as it cuts through something, it pumped through something and filtered. So uh, they just don't use the garnet. And also something to keep in mind, do not put your hand in the water jet. I know it sounds really cute. It's like high pressure water. Oh, it's high pressure water. It will, <laughs> it will de-glove your hand and you'll just be left with bones. And if the garnet's on, you won't have the bones either. So it's just water, but it's not cute. It is something very dangerous. And unlike the laser cutter you can see here, there's not really like a guard that kind of stops you from going in there. So just be aware of that. Because certain operations may require you to, for instance, move the splash guard. So you can see in this upper image, the splash guard's down. In the lower image, that yellow splash guard's been flipped up. With certain cuts, you may have to move that splash guard in order to cut an uneven piece of material or something, in which case you're exposing yourself to that jet. So again, don't touch the jet. There's horrifying videos online of people putting dummy hands through there, and it's horrifying to see what a water jet will do to a hand. So it'll cost you a lot more than just $200 if you put your hand in there. Um, and again, it can cut anything given enough time. It'll cut stone, glass, other very hard things, and also big things. So if for whatever reason, like in that top image, you wanted to cut a countertop, you could easily just throw a slab of granite on there and it will erode that into a nice shape for you. It will also cut thick metals. So again, it's just eroding them. Keep in mind, um, the water jet will leave really sharp edges on what it cuts. So make sure to be careful. Maybe if you can, use handling gloves. Um, and if you have the opportunity, if it's material that's soft enough, you can even just use some sandpaper or some other grinding stone to remove some of that sharp edge, depending on what its final use case will be. Um, it is CNC controlled, just like all the other machines we've been talking about. Um, and it can also cut at angles, you get it just right. Uh, in some instances, I've seen people actually angle the material on the cutting bit, so it cuts a beveled edge across something. Um, I don't believe the water jet downstairs has an angled axis, if I'm not mistaken. It just it has an extra axis. axis. Yeah, it's just it doesn't have an additional axis. You have yet. to set stuff up. Yeah, you have but, to set it up to cut at an angle. But you can raise the head pretty high, and you have some flexibility to, to texture things and whatever angle you want to cut. Yep. Especially helpful if, if you guys ever get onto uh, form turning on the metal lathe. Water jet's a great way to make some wacky forms, cut at an angle so you can turn that into a form turning tool and harden it and all that stuff. Uh, it's a fun thing you can do. But uh, you always have to make sure the material is held. As you can see in these images, 
the water jet just has like these weird ribs you lay stuff onto. So you have to make sure that the work holding is really secure, either with clamps or weights, and making sure the part won't shift during cutting. Um, it can get a little sloppy in there, but it's not that bad. Um, and you also got to realize that certain parts that might be cut out, you might have to put a tab on them to make sure they just don't drop down in certain instances so the part won't just drop uh, while it's being cut. That's where you have to add tabs to something. Like this slide talks about. We add tabs so that, and I'm sorry about that big block being there that says content review. But essentially, tabs are going to interrupt the flow and still allow the material to be attached. You'll typically use tabs on something that will be easy to cut afterwards. Hey. hey. <laughs> Wasn't sure if you had to edit that. So. Um, but um, for the Omax editor, uh, that's the system, the actual software that powers the water jet. Um, it has control T, so you can add tabs to different areas. And again, make sure it's something you can cut afterwards. So if you're cutting a big block of stone, it's probably big enough and heavy enough <laughs> where you don't have to worry about it shifting once you cut it out completely. But for, uh, for instance, if you're cutting uh, relatively thin sheet metal or even like up to half inch thick sheet metal, you're going to need that object to kind of stay there, especially if you have very important features that have to be maintained. And so again, afterwards, once you're done, you can take it off the stock and you can use a hacksaw to cut through it. But if it was a big chunk of stone and you can cut through it all completely, well, what are you going to cut it with? Just some things to keep in mind. So next steps for us to take care of. We are going to get badged on all this stuff and we're going to design in vector software of our choice. Inkscape is great because um, it is free and it is used by the machines downstairs. If you already have an Illustrator, all that stuff can be imported. Um, I'd like to do some demos on my computer just to show you some quick things about these different programs I've talked about. Um, I just want to make sure people online will be able to know about it or see it at least. Yeah, you, you can open it okay. Um, and so the ne other next step for you is to cut out something on the vinyl plotter um, start simple and, you know, get more complicated. If you're feeling incredibly ambitious, try to get it on the water jet, see what you can do, get some exotic material, to cut something out. So what I'd really like to do is, um, and you'll see these, um, cool, uh, resources, because of course we're going to share doc this um, document with you, so you'll be able to check out that stuff. So, um, I'm just going to open up. Inkscape, if I spell it correctly, on Adam's computer. It's already open. Yeah. Oh, look at that. The project he was working on is there. That's cool. But I don't want to mess up any of Adam's great work, so I'm going to start a new file. And first things first, if anybody can't see this, I believe you shared the desktop, Adam, so everybody should be able to see what's going on. Oh. Oh, oh, oh. I really find it really weird that Inkscape on a Mac opens so tiny. I'm just trying to make this bigger. All right, beautiful. So um, you can see in Inkscape, um, it's a pretty straightforward vector program. Um, anybody not familiar, um, scrolling, with it will, of course, uh, zoom in and out, but also using plus and minus on the keyboard zooms in and out. You've got rulers along the top and you can drag guides down from those rulers to help you lay out certain things on your artwork. Um, like any other good artwork program, uh, we of course can do the basic simple shapes, creating rectangles, creating circles, and we can also create polygons. So uh, some of you may have a little bit of this for review, but just to go over, we can create something like a simple rectangle, and then we can also edit its fill. So if I go over to the fill tab here, and I go over to the selection tool, make sure the actual shape is selected. I can change its fill. Let's say in this instance, I want it to be red. 
Uh, here we see in the RGB environment, red, green, blue. The A is for alpha or opacity. If I'm intending to have this cut out by any machine, it should always be 100%. If I want to do something artistic and interesting looking, I can play around with those uh, different transparencies and even gradients if I wish. Stroke paint controls the actual color of the stroke. In this case, it's already set to black. Stroke style allows me to specify how big the stroke actually is. Um, typically, if we're working with any of the machines, we tend to recommend using the pixel scale. Um, and you can do all kinds of things to make it a lot bigger. And I think the fill, I still didn't 100%. There we go. It's also kind of fun. 100% uh, on the colors in RGB is 255, but 100% in alpha is 100. They decided not to use the same number for alpha. Don't know why. But you can see I can control an outline. And what's also interesting is that let's say I go to an ellipse and toss in an ellipse like this. It's remembered all my previous settings on what I had already done for the rectangle. Um, I can also just go ahead and easily change the color. So why don't I make this kind of weird magenta? And I think I'll make the stroke kind of an annoying green color. Like I'm kind of interested here because I actually find this very painful to look at. I'm having a hard time looking at it. My eyes are getting angry. Um, but I wanted to show two different colors here to talk about Boolean operations, which are a great way to get multiple uh, types of shapes. And that tool, the Boolean operator, is where is it on here? Just got to get used to Adam's computer. Is that it? Can you tell I'm mostly used to Illustrator? Is that one? No, no, no. It's it's like the weird little box shape, right? Here we go. So we have the. Um, different sets of this. You can see union, difference, intersection, exclusion, division, and cutting the path. You can also see combine and break apart. So Adam still has touch clicking on his laptop, so I tend to accidentally click. But uh, what's also cool about this Inkscape is that it has another way to do this that is even easier to see. And where is it? Where is it? Well, at any rate, if we go to union, it unifies the shapes. So wherever they touch, it becomes one and it becomes one shape. Um, but if we Go over here, select them again. We can see in path, if we do difference, the uppermost object is subtracted from the lowermost object. And as with all the other permutations, it um, will do that. This, you know, that's duplicate. I keep going back to that one because it looks exactly like the symbol. But what's nice about Inkscape is that the newer versions have a great interface where it actually allows you to choose how the union or difference occurs. That's what I'm trying to find, because there's an actual dialogue for it. Seems like somebody in the chat. Somebody says in the chat, what's going on? Oh, uh, somebody's saying goodbye. Yep. Um, let's see here. That's a line of distribute. Ah, here, I'm just going to open it up on mine real quick. I need Let's see, how well can I type my password with one hand? Not well. So if I have, uh, where is it? Yeah, okay, it should, yeah, that's where I thought it was. Okay, so for those of you in the room, I'll just demonstrate this real quick. 
I have that magenta shape and I have this shape. I'm gonna change it to blue. The cool thing in the most recent version of Inkscape is if I go down to this third symbol, they have the shape builder tool. So instead of having it as separate selections here, I can actually click on this and it opens up a, this is an Inkscape. Yeah, I know, but where? Third symbol down on the control bar here and it's called the shape builder. As soon as you hit it, it opens up this dialogue and it shows you how it's going to subdivide the shapes. So I can click on what I want to keep and then I hit okay. And so it gives me a preview of what I'm gonna do. But here's another cool thing it does. If I have them selected, I can also do union operations. If I click and drag and select multiples, it builds the shape for me. Now pay attention to the color, it's the magenta. But if I activate it again, and it's the third one down, shape builder, uh, shortcut is X. But if I scroll, if I drag from this direction and hit okay, it uses the style settings of the other shape that I started dragging from. So it's a little bit of an expanded way of doing the same thing that I just find a little bit more intuitive than uh, the traditional way. Adams is a little closer to how it works downstairs, which is probably better to have on your computer, so I know how it works. <laughs> yeah, you gotta get the new version. Um, and uh, the other thing to note in terms of creating cool shapes is of course the pen tool or the Bezier curve tool. Uh, we've talked about this last week. You can see how I'm clicking and dragging and I'm clicking and dragging a node and this little circular thing away from it but that's not the line. This red object that is stretching out is the line. That vector is being interpolated between whatever new point I'm going to create. And it's changing rapidly as I move the mouse around. If I just click, that is a sharp point and the next node will simply be a straight line. But if I click and drag at the same time, you can see I'm creating that vector influence again. And I'm able to create curvilinear lines very quickly and I can create really dynamic shapes. What's also cool is you can see there's a red highlight once the Bezier curve reaches the end and I have created a shape. And now just like before, I can slap another shape on top and it becomes exactly like any of the other shapes we'd be interacting with. And I can go to the different shape builder commands and create a difference between them to make the shape even more dynamic. There's a lot of things you can do uh, with this program in terms of creating vector artwork. Again, just to also cover one of the basic tools that's really good to know, the Polystar tool. So right now I can set a star with four corners, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, however many your heart desires. And you can also switch it to polygons and it uses that exact same number to create the subdivisions of the polygon. A very powerful tool for creating subdivisions. Like let's say if you want to use this as construction geometry to help you lay something out. That's a very helpful way to use that tool. Those are just some basic things in Inkscape that should give you enough to get started. Um, one thing and uh, to also talk about is finding stuff online. When you're searching for stuff, you can search for like lamb. SVG, like actually search for lamb picture illustration SVG, and it will give you editable SVG items. Because if you just copy and paste something offline, it's going to be pixels, not vector artwork. Um, I can actually, for right now, let's see if I can reconnect, because I would like to show that. Let's see if I have the ability to connect. No, I don't it seems oh back online can i make it but at any rate that covers all the basics for everything we need to cover about inkscape and it looks like i can get back in i have to end it to start Join in. So I'm going to hop back in and I'm going to share my screen just to show a couple of other demos real quick. So 
I'm just going to stop Adam. Adam, 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 Adam. Cool music yeah. effect. <laughs> so just real quick, I want to go over um, how to, how to uh, understand, understand things and look at a few of the similarities and differences between programs. So I'm going to share my screen for the benefit of those online share that and so i got a few programs open um i'll demonstrate this again real quick the shape building tool in inkscape for those watching you can see here i've got two shapes and then the third item you can see here's the selection tool the node edit tool and then right down here the third one the newest version of inkscape the shape builder and here's the dialog it opens. I can select independent shapes and hit done. And it gives me a preview of what the difference is actually going to be. And I can also click and drag to build a shape and hit okay. And whatever shape I start from and drag, those style properties will be applied. Other things to note are of course, uh, actual orientation tools, quick rotation, quick mirror, in Inkscape, and also arrangement in space. Every layer in these programs is basically infinitely layered. So by that, I can actually move this rectangle down to be underneath my blue dynamic shape. And that is something to get used to. And that's what we're talking about, keeping things in one layer. You want to make sure either everything is contiguous in one shape altogether or that you're working from different isolated layers because while there's actual space in Inkscape here on one layer, we're just on one layer. If I go to the layer tab in here, I can add a whole other layer to work with that would be completely isolated from all of this artwork. And it will have infinitely many sub layers that I can add artwork to. So if I do that, I add a new layer. We're going to go ahead and call it layer two and go to layer one. I can lock it so that I can't edit anything there. Now you can see, can't do anything with this stuff, but I can draw something new on top that will not interact in any way with the other objects. Even if I try to select them, I can still only manipulate this. And so that's what I was talking about with maintaining layers, but also realizing that there are arrangement layers between each of the objects in a layer. But ultimately, it's it's flat. When, once you're ready to export the file, it's all in one layer. Right. But to also, uh, to that point, if I go to view outlines, this is what the machines will see. It'll see all these lines layered on top of each other. So if what I thought were contiguous shapes, they're gonna be cut out in a full pattern, that won't actually happen. The machine will instead cut all of these independent shapes and I'm left with a hodgepodge of different objects. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's important to realize how many A, layers you're working with and B, what's on those layers and how they're going to interact. That's why it's always good to jump between outline mode and normal mode, just to make sure your artwork is going to make sense once you get to the vinyl cutter. So if I really wanted this pink shape to have a, a little corner cut out of it like this so that I could send this to um, the vinyl cutter and have these shapes ready to overlay one another, I'd have to actually cut the blue shape out of the pink. So I can do that in a couple of different ways. And I'll demonstrate one that can be pretty effective. So let's say I select this blue shape. I'm going to copy it using the shortcut. And I'm actually going to uh, get a new layer. We're going to call it layer three. I'm going to lock layer one. I'm also going to hide it. You can see the different symbols there. So I'm in layer three. And I'm going to do a special paste. I'm going to go to paste in place. That means it's going to paste it in the exact location I copied it from. So now I have a duplication of that. I'm also going to go back to the first layer. And I'm going to make it visible again. And I'm going to grab my magenta square. 
I, I have to keep looking up at the screen to know what color it is because my laptop has a night shift mode, so all the colors are distorted. So I don't want to refer it to the wrong thing. But I'm going to copy that shape and hide that. Now I'm going to come back here to this layer. And again, I'm going to edit, make sure this layer is highlighted. And I'm going to paste in place. All right, so now I've got that there. I need to make sure um, what's cool about this is that because I have the shape builder tool, I don't really have to worry about the order things are stacked in the sub layer. Like I had to show with the example on Adam's computer. In this case, go to shape builder. This is the shape I need to be there. And boom, now I have that shape. So what I can do is I'm going to copy this, hide that layer, bring layer one back. And I'm actually going to go ahead and delete that. And I'm going to go ahead and paste in place. And you can see the shortcut is just holding shift when you paste. So I've actually got that shape in there. Now when I go to view, I go to outline, that's what the, that's what the machines are actually going to see. This is not also 100% perfect. There is still a double line here. Um, I would make sure to remove that double line first before going to the final cutter. But generally, you can see I've got the shape just right. I would just have to remove this node in here. And I can do that quite simply. Select the object, node editor, hit that node, delete, and then delete that line. Okay, hey, well, an illustrator, you do it that easily. <laughs> but I'd have to just it's the break path at selected nodes. But it's a little bit more, the one to the left, I think, if you have both those nodes the selected. Segment between yeah. Those yeah. So yeah. Get rid of that guy. So in Illustrator, you can just do that by simply clicking on it. And this, you got to hit another button. Now you can see. Break segment. Yep. Uh, yeah, remove segment between. Yeah, so I have it selected. I got the node selector tool. You can see here, delete segment between two non endpoint nodes or join segment to form a new segment. So I highlighted the segment by clicking on it, hit this button to delete it. Do you know you an old version of the software will actually recognize the shape builder function? It should. Yeah, so you're you're changing the vectors. So if you save that SVG and open it on the laser computers, the vectors will be there. It just yeah. won't have that functionality for doing that, yeah. doing the Boolean operations but that way. Because it'll SVG recognize the results. It's a transfer format, so it just has the geometric data of how the shape is made. But you can see now I've done it properly where there's a single line here and a single line to find the outside, just from working with those shapes. Now, show sure similar but different. Illustrator, very similar artwork environment, um, very similar tools, and I can do a lot of the things that Inkscape can do in Illustrator. Um, and it operates in a very similar fashion. You know, it just has obviously different uh, names for everything and different locations for certain tools. But you can see I can create just as many garish shapes and colors as I can in Inkscape, but looks very similar. Another one we talked about was Sketch. Um, I don't have Sketch, but my license expired, but I do have Figma, which is very similar. These are mostly used for prototyping um, apps and stuff. So here's an example of one. Um, I built this entire, all these different panels that show different screenshots for it. And then and I can also connect all of that with different animation. This is driven by vector artwork. It's all vector artwork in this system. And I can preview it and it will function as I've set it to. It's basically like a PowerPoint on steroids, if you will. 
and it allows you to simulate the proper aspect ratios and interface of any mobile device. It's probably going to work a little slow because it just doesn't like it when I have so much stuff open. But oh, uh, uh, there we go. I'm going to load it real quick. I recommend Figma also because it is free as well. And if you're interested in getting into anything like UI UI design, um, it's a great tool to have. Uh, you can easily, there you can see it's got like a little fake finger set up. And yeah, I can like create all these different things. This is just a really crude login page that I made and stuff. And I can go to all kinds of different stuff and create scrolling effects. But you know, that's just kind of something you can do, adds a little bit more life to your artwork. Um, but that's something really cool to use. What I also want to demonstrate is the difference between um, files you find online and other types. So if I go to presentation, which is still going to be up here, exit out of that. The noun project is a great place to find different types of icons. Um, let's say it just has to be a little search for some reason. You search sword and something like this, it will bring up icons of that. And they're all in vector artwork. So here's like a pretty simple one. So a few different ways I can do it. Um, you always uh, you just basically create an account and you can get any icon and download it. But like, let's say I want to be real smart. I'm just going to copy the image. <laughs> You're not going to get any of my info. And I paste it here, it's just pixels. See? Uh, oh, and I have a specialty brush on right now. Mm -hmm. Even if I go into a vector environment like Illustrator and try to paste it, it's still just pixels. You can see the difference between the vector artwork below and the pixels above. So what you actually have to do is download it see, uh, you know, just getting a basic download of an SVG. You can also download a PNG. That's also just another file format. But got this. It's all ready to go. I can grab it out of my downloads folder. And I can dump it into AI or other any other graphics program of my choice. I'm going to delete this pixelated one. And just put this in. So see, now it's actually all vector artwork that I can edit. See, it's not losing its pixelation. pixelation. You can also see all the nodes. Again, if I go to Inkscape, same deal. I'm going to turn off outline mode. Back to normal. Sake of clarity, I'm going to go ahead and add a new layer just so I'm not dealing with all of our legacy stuff. And boom, got it right there. And I can. Yep. And oh, that's the image I copied before, actually. I've got to import the SVG. And yeah, you can do trace bitmap. The problem is with trace bitmap is it um, leads to a lot of artifacts, and the software isn't. Because what's going to happen is it's going to see the pixels and it's going to start like tracing around the pixels. And there are different things you can control to reduce noise and stuff like that, but it's always going to be a little bit imperfect because the software still isn't great at just knowing when to just make a freaking straight line. Um, but yeah, just like before, we've got the artwork, I can just drop, drop it in. Uh, da, 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 da. Um, uh, so here's so another here's thing another to pay attention to, DPI for rendered SVG. Inkscape is in a 96 DPI environment. Most other vector programs are in a 72. So if you're trying to do stuff like design something in Illustrator, then bring it over to Inkscape to the laser cutter downstairs, your stuff gets scaled randomly. Um, and so this is the reason. Newer versions call out what your environment's going to be when you import something. Um, but older versions, you either have to leave what I call a key object of a known size, so you know the scaling factor you have to go to get to the original, or just know to change the environment number before you export. 
what you can see here, this is that vector artwork that I just got, no pixels. And if I zoom out, I can see the nodes. So don't fool yourself by just uh, copy and pasting offline because it's always going to be a bitmap image. Um, and again, if you're searching for something like, let's say, something that we'll definitely find. You can see people have a lot of SVG stuff. Some of it will be paid, some of it will be free. Dirty little secret is exactly what Gina was saying. If you get any of this vector art and you don't want to pay for it, you could, in theory, just drag it and use the uh, trace bitmap option to create a facsimile of it. Just realize that there can be um, certain issues with how they're going to interpret the bitmap tracing when it comes to creating vector artwork. Um, you know, I can demonstrate that with, for instance, if I go back here. So we saw how efficiently the sword was built. If I go back, this is the actual copy paste one I did. See, it's all pixeled. I can trace this bitmap. I think it's under path. It is under path. It's always weird how they organize stuff. The third down. There we go. So you can see here, um, with the certain controls of tracing bitmap. Um, it tells you the mode that it's going to use to detect edges. There's a few different types you can use. Um, typically, standard ones are fine. Threshold is how much it's going to um, pay attention to little details. The higher the threshold, the finer it's actually going to look at certain details. And then you can do things like, um, <laughs> excuse me, <laughs> actually um, change how it's going to look at and um, alter the image. So if I hit apply, apply it's going to go ahead and trace it. And I've got a tracing here. And it's not bad, actually. You know, but there are few Might notes. be the best yeah. tracing. I know, because it's also coming from like a very, a very simple image. Very simple. Yeah. The... yeah. But yeah, you can see. So there's the trace. And that actually is probably pretty close to the original SVG file. Yeah, yeah, almost indiscernible. I see. I see one little. I see one little artifact that's interesting. Here, so let's highlight them both in the node tool. Oh, you can only highlight one object at a time with nodes, huh? God damn it! <laughs> yeah, you can do that in Illustrator. It's not a problem. <laughs> but see, uh, there's some midpoint artifacts here, and a few more artifacts around the tip. Whereas with the true original source SVG, there are fewer notes. Honestly, given that it's such simple artwork, it's fairly negligible. And at this scale, you're not really going to notice it. You know, but just realize that it's going to increase the number of nodes because it's not able to detect when it just is one single straight line. But those are some of the little things about working online with SVGs and um, bitmaps and stuff like that. Um, they're great to sort of integrate things together. Um, and obviously, uh, Inkscape is also a great tool for working with vectors and also transitioning that between vectors and pixel art as well. Um, so that should conclude anything with the demos there. Um, are there any questions either for anybody left online and uh, anybody in the room? All right. Goodbye, everybody out there. We'll see you next week.